Welcome to the Nervous System Unit. We are going to start with functions and structures of the nervous system. So there are three main functions of the nervous system. To monitor internal and external environments. So monitoring the internal environment is basically making sure that we're maintaining homeostasis. Monitoring the external environment is making sure that um, the body is in kind of a safe location. In order to do this, we have to integrate or kind of analyze sensory information. We have to collect it and analyze it. That's what integrate means. And then we coordinate voluntary and involuntary responses. So voluntary means with conscious mind, like you're choosing to do that action. Involuntary is something that your brain does without your conscious choice. So you do not tell your heart to beat. Your brain has mechanisms in place to keep your heart beating without you dedicating conscious thought to it doing that. So here's how the nervous system is broken down. So we have the two main sides of the nervous system, which is the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system consists of the brain and the spinal cord, whereas the peripheral nervous system it contains our sensory pathways, so those are the neurons that carry sensory information. It also has our motor pathways, and these are where motion is being applied to some part of the body. We have the autonomic side, which is the involuntary side, where um, these things, again, do not need your conscious thought to be done. And then we also have the somatic side, the voluntary side, um, that can give us um, ways to move like our hands or our, or our feet when we so choose. There are two types of cells in the nervous system. There are neurons. These are the actual functioning parts of the nervous system. They're ones that are carrying out the functions we talked about just a minute ago. Um, and then we also have glial cells. These are the support cells. These are going to provide like um, extracellular matrix, those kinds of things, um, protection. Um, they're going to look for infection, so they have some immunity functions. So that's what we mean by support. It's not that they aren't functional, it's just that they aren't working towards the functions of the system overall. They're ensuring that the system is healthy and can continue to do its function. So let's talk about neural glial cells. So these are the glial cells. And these come in two varieties, the neural glial cells that we find in the central nervous system and the neural glials we find in the peripheral nervous system. And you'll see the abbreviation CNS a lot. That just stands for central nervous system. And then PNS is the peripheral nervous system. So the four types of neural glial cells we find in the central nervous system are astrocytes, and these are the largest and most numerous. Um, they are the ones that are working on the blood-brain barrier. So while we do want the nutrients and the oxygen out of the blood, we don't necessarily want the blood um, fully integrating into the brain because it can also carry things like infectious agents. So astrocytes are working to make sure that there are no infectious agents getting past that barrier. And then um, this also is providing a structural framework. So it's providing some fibers that allow the neurons to rest on them. And then also it dam uh, repairs damaged neural tissue. Um, then we have oligodendrocytes. And oligodendrocytes are creating the myelin sheaths. So myelin sheaths are a coating on the axons of neurons that allow for the electrical impulse that runs down the axon 
to be relayed faster. So oligodendrocytes are creating that. Then we have microglia, which derive from white blood cells and perform a protective function. So these, like I said, are going to um, be like immune cells that we see elsewhere in the body, but they are specific to the brain. And then we have ependymal, and these are going to create the brain and spinal fluid. So um, your brain is actually suspended in a fluid um, in order to not collapse under its own weight. And so we produce that ependymal fluid, um, that brain and spinal fluid through the ependymal cells. So here you can just kind of see how all of those cells are kind of integrated into the neurons. And so you can see those oligodendrocytes here making those myelin sheaths. They're actually wrapping around the axons, um, like coiling paper around a pencil. You can see the astrocytes there. They're going to be monitoring and providing, you know, support. And then the microglia, they're, you know, patrolling and looking for infection. And then here you can see a, a chart that you have in your notes. I included this in your notes so that you could have like a picture of what these cells look like. So um, you can go ahead and get that labeled. And we're going to talk about our peripheral uh, neuroglial in just a second. There are two types of um, neuroglial cells found in the peripheral nervous system. They consist of satellite cells. Um, these are similar to astrocytes and they support nerve function, which means they're going to be making like connective fibers, um, monitoring um, the uh, um, neural function, that kind of thing. And then we have Schwann cells. These are producing the myelin sheath in the peripheral nervous system. So they actually wrap all the way around the axon, whereas what we saw with the oligodendrocytes is that they just had an extension of the cell body that wrapped around. So how does a Schwann cell wrap around an axon? So here you can see that axon in yellow, and it actually goes through and um, wraps the cell membrane um, and the cell repeatedly around that. And the benefit of a myelin sheath like this is that it prevents the ions that are going to um, be released when an electrical impulse goes through the axon from floating away. They're trapped right there against the cell membrane of the axon. So neurons, these are the cells that do the main function of the nervous system to pass information. So we're moving information around in the nervous system and that is done by neurons. So labeling the neuron, things you should be familiar with, the dendrites. This is where we receive information. So this is the receptive side. Then we have the cell body. You can see the nucleus and all of the like organelles that you are familiar with right in there. And then you can see the axon leading down out of the cell body. And the axon is how we pass information. This is one long um, extension of the cell body um, down to the axon terminals. And this is how we are able to relay information very quickly because we send an impulse along the axon. And you can see that impulse direction. That is flowing away from the cell body along the axon. So information is received at the dendrites it is passed along the cell membrane until it reaches the axon and then the axon sends that electrical impulse down its length to the axon terminals.
neurons can be classed by their shape or by their function. And we're gonna start with cell shapes of neurons. We have um, four different types that we're gonna focus on. We're gonna look at bipolar neurons. These have two extensions off of the cell body. Then we have unipolar, which is where we have just a singular extension off of the cell body, and then it goes in two different directions. Then we have multipolar, which is what you just saw and labeled. Um, you have the dendrites here, and then you have that long axon. And then we also have pyramidal, which is where there are lots of different extensions off of the cell body. And just kind of giving you um, some other ones. Um, so you can kind of see, um, like some of these are the same, like the multipolar and the bipolar. Then we have anaxonic, anaxonic um, which means it doesn't have a true axon. And um, we can't tell the difference between axons and dendrites. And then um, pseudo unipolar is where the cell body is so close to this one long section here that um, it it's basically indistinguishable and so it it is almost unipolar I guess is how to describe that. All right, functional classification. So based on what a neuron does, we have another way to classify it. It can be a sensory neuron, and this is supposed to send information um, from sensory receptors all throughout the body to the central nervous system. These are almost always unipolar, and generally what happens here is that the cell bodies are located in ganglia in the peripheral nervous system. And we'll talk more about those terms, the ganglia and the peripheral nervous system, when we get to the peripheral nervous system. Then we have motor neurons. These carry impulses from the central nervous system to effectors that are going to allow us to make motion happen. These are generally multipolar, and most cell bodies are located somewhere in the central nervous system, except when we have some autonomic neurons. Then we have interneurons. These lie between the motor and sensory neurons. Um, they also will, you'll also see the term association neurons. And their whole job is to make sure signals get through um, the central nervous system pathways and almost exclusively found in the central nervous system. And 99% of the body's neurons are interneurons. Okay, so now that we've established what we know about neurons, I want to talk a little bit about how a neuron works. And a neuron works through action potentials. So a resting neuron has sodium ions, and those are positive on the outside of the cell membrane. And on the inside of the cell membrane, you have potassium ions, not quite as many as you have sodium ions outside, but those so, uh, potassium ions are closely associated with some negatively charged proteins. That combination results in a difference in charge on either side of the membrane. So outside the cell membrane, we have a positive charge. Inside the cell membrane, we have a negative charge. When we talk about a resting neuron, it has a negative 70 microvolts 
um, charge when we look at the inside of the cell. So you'll see that resting voltage come up a lot. At this point, the neuron is what we call polarized. And we are going to go through depolarization in order to send that information very quickly down the axon. So what is depolarization? So when an axon is triggered to fire, when depolarization needs to happen, what's going to happen is that we're going to open up these channels and the sodium ions are going to flow into the cell and our negatively charged proteins are gonna flow out of the cell. So what kind of like channels can we have? We could have a ligand gated channel. Ligand is just a name for a molecule. So in this case, a neurotransmitter comes along, binds to this channel, and it opens it like a key in a locked door. So we unlock the door and the sodium ions can flow into the cell. Mechanically gated channels are also available. This is where uh, we put pressure on the cell membrane and it like pulls open the channel allowing for those neurons to depolarize, allowing for those um, ions to flow through the, the cell membrane. And then we have voltage gated. This only fires once a, the voltage inside of the cell gets to a certain point. So this only opens once we have reached a certain threshold of depolarization. And this is how we can kind of speed up this message getting sent. We don't slow down as we go along. We can in fact like, you know, accelerate um, this like depolarization process by using a combination of all of these different ion channels. So what happens to the voltage inside of the neuron when depolarization occurs? So remember, resting we have negative 70 millivolts inside the neuron and we're going to have eventually a stimulus. So a stimulus is what's going to tell the neuron that it needs to open those channels. So it, it could most likely it's going to be that it's received a neurotransmitter and that neurotransmitter has opened a few of those ions, ion channels. When we have failed initiations, that means that we're not getting enough activity, enough ion channels are not opening to actually send the message along. In order for depolarization to occur, we have to pass the threshold of negative 55 millivolts. And that means enough of our ion channels have to open to change the inside voltage to the point where we pass that threshold. That's basically to prevent your neuron from firing all the time. If it has to have a threshold of, I'm not passing on a signal until I feel like there's enough information here to make it worth it. That's what the threshold does. It allows for, you know, things that are fleeting or not very important to not really get passed along. So then we pass the threshold. The stimulus is strong enough that enough ion channels are opening up so that we can pass the threshold and we go into full depolarization. 
At that point, it is a cascade reaction. We're not stopping. Once we reach the top, that is our action potential. That is the highest point, and the inside voltage at that point is a positive 40 millivolts. Once we reach that, generally what's happening is that we have passed along the information from our neuron to the next neuron in the sequence. And so after that, we can repolarize. So this is where we're going to close those channels, close those ion gates. And in fact, we do that so quickly and so well that we go through hyperpolarization and then we come back to resting stage as we fully fix the arrangement of ions on either side of the membrane. So the key aspect of repolarization and hyperpolarization that I want you to know is the sodium potassium pump. The sodium potassium pump works against the concentration gradient to move sodium ions out of the cell and potassium ions into the cell. And this is how we repolarize the membrane. This is how we are able to get that negative 70 millivolts back is through the use of these sodium potassium pumps. So we've passed the information along our neuron, down our axon. Now we're getting ready to send that information to the next neuron. And that takes place at the synapse. The synapse um, can either release the synapse can release lots of different types of neurotransmitters. It's based on what the neuron can make. Um, not all neurons can make all neurotransmitters. And so certain pathways use certain neurotransmitters. And so once we have that nerve impulse coming down the axon and it gets here to the synapse, we're going to still have that voltage gated channel here, but this time we're moving calcium ions into the cell. And when that happens, those calcium ions force the synaptic vesicles to move down towards the end of the cell, towards the synaptic cleft. At the synaptic cleft, the vesicles are going to bond to the cell membrane and release their neurotransmitters into that cleft. This is truly a gap. It is just a big space between the two neurons. And those neurotransmitters are going to float across the cleft to the postsynaptic neuron, and they're going to attach to the neurotransmitter receptor on a ligand-gated channel. What forces the neurotransmitters to move? It's diffusion. Because we have a higher concentration of neurotransmitters here, they naturally want to flow across the cleft to where it is a lower concentration of neurotransmitter. When we are finished with those, they are going to be reabsorbed back into the um, presynaptic neuron. When we open those postsynaptic neuron ligand gated channels, the sodium ions are going to flow in and that depolarization process is going to continue again. That's what a nerve impulse is. It is depolarization occurring all along that cell membrane of the neuron. That's how we send an impulse. Neurotransmitters can either be excitatory or inhibitory, and that just means whether or not they're going to stimulate depolarization or whether they will work against depolarization. 
So here's what I mean. So excitatory neurotransmitters open up those ligand gated channels and move the neuron closer to that depolarization threshold. Inhibitory move the neuron further away from the threshold. They cause maybe more sodium ions to be pumped out of the cell, making it harder for the cell to actually meet the threshold. And so time and the number of um, ex the number of stimulations matters. So here we have two evenly spaced excitatory messages, excitatory synapses. And you can see here that we're not getting past that threshold. But if we have them very close together, then that does not have enough time to reset and we get depolarization. Or if we're getting two different signals to the same neuron. So if they both hit at the same time, then that excites the neuron enough to depolarize. But if we get some inhibitory information, that actually makes it more difficult for us to reach the threshold. So I just wanted to kind of go over those kinds of ways that the synapse is going to influence whether or not we actually see a depolarization event or not. And so, this understanding this is really important for understanding how the nervous system overall really works. So I would highly encourage you to take some time to really sit down and write through what the steps of a synapse and how we actually move information from one neuron to the next and how that really looks. And that will end our introduction to the nervous system on to the central nervous system next.